Okay, what are the challenges from the results of uh, neural recording during the binocular rivalry? Can we make sense of uh, these results? So neural activities during binocular rivalry has been uh, recorded in also a uh, human uh, medial temporal lobe. And the uh, results are largely consistent with those performed in monkey IT. So that's the one that you saw in the last video. But then upon considering all of this, and also the finding that I didn't mention so far, can we really make sense of all these results? That's a question. Uh, in fact, if you stop and then think about it, the results from the binocular library becomes a, a bit strange, really. And that also um, asks us to rethink what are we actually seeing with this NCS type uh, research. So uh, in the end, we start to uh, need to think about the theories of consciousness and then uh, see whether we can really assume something like a particular neuron to be responsible for a particular quail. That is a sort of the implicit assumption of the NCC research, right? The minimum set of the neurons that are jointly sufficient for the particular conscious person. Is it actually possible? Let's move on to the actual experiment. So first is that um, uh, this binocular rivalry experiment uh, performed in the epilepsy patient in humans. So here, for example, uh, one uh, example paradigm is to present the rivalry experiment where uh, snakes and one particular person, uh, one eye to the other, right? And then over the time, uh, people, uh, the patient reports, oh, I'm seeing uh, uh, snakes and then now face and the snakes and so on. And then uh, what they did, um, so this is becoming more and more popular in the standard of the neural core consciousness is to make the uh, phenomenology of the control condition as uh, similar as possible during the binocular rivalry. And it turned out to be very, very critical. So here, recording the dynamics of how the subjects actually reported, they uh, pro, uh, researchers generated the movie, but that uh, is not uh, presented to the left eye and the right eye separately, but a joint tree, and then make some kind of, you know, uh, mimic the mixed percept as much as possible. And that's called a replay condition. And uh, uh, when the replay is done properly, then the uh, response pattern of the snakes and the uh, person can become very, very similar between the two trials, like this way. And then using this type of the paradigm, what they did was initially first to screen out and uh, one particular neuron that prefers one stimulus, but not the other. So here uh, they found a particular neuron that responds to house, any kind of house, it, it turns out. And then they found, you know, in each of the trial, they, they see, you know, very strong response like this, you know, each of the uh, dot corresponds to one spike. And this is average, you know, when the house is on, there's a transient increase of the firing 20 hertz. And then the stimulus itself is presented for one seconds, but you know, that's a transient response. And then uh, Ed Helms, which is um, the, the famous person, but uh, that particular neuron doesn't respond much to that um, stimulus. Now, uh, when they pair these two stimulus under the binocular rivalry, what happens? So here's this uh, situation. During the binocular rivalry, when a um, uh, patient starts to report Ed Helms, seeing Ed Helms to house, and then at the time of the bottom press to be aligned at you know, zero. Then during this, you know, a purple, that's a rivalry experiment, okay? And then during the rivalry, before starting to say house, there is a bunch of firing here. And then it's, it's sustained to some extent, but you know, uh, the prominent kind of firing comes before pressing the button to report that it's uh, uh, you know house, which is reminding of the uh, case of the uh, uh, monkey you know IT neurons, right? So on average, it looks like this. On the other hand, in the replay condition, uh, then uh, subjects also press a button, but there's some kind of delay, and uh, uh, it accounts for something like here. The bottom press is about 500 milliseconds, and it corresponds to uh, the increase of the uh, neural response upon seeing the physically you know, flipped stimulus here. And then when the uh, percept is reported from house to Ed Helms, 
then um, there was not much uh, firing uh, based on this image and seeing this uh, at the helms in this case. And uh, on average, when they aligned all these response across many neurons, then what they found is something like this. So over the 36 uh, neurons for rivalry condition and uh, 26 for the replay condition, they see very sharp increase before the bottom press, zero for uh, replay condition. And somewhat sharp, but also, you know, um, preceding like one second before the bottom press in the case of the rivalry. There is a difference between these two you know, conditions. But from the consciousness research point of view, the critical question is whether this is really the neural correlates of consciousness, you might think. What, what is the meaning of this transient you know, increase here or here with respect to this sustained period of the activity? So sustainability of the activity, you know, they, they are, you know, reporting, seeing the uh, house or, you know, snakes or whatever. But uh, initial response is much, much stronger, right? Is it a trait of the non-conscious response? Or, or what is it? They, this is actually quite unclear. If this is a neurons that are the NCC, then it should be corresponding to our phenomena at any point in time, right? So does it correspond to our phenomenological scene? But in, um, it's very unclear at the moment because um, if you do the binocular rivalry, then the parser tends to actually change over the time. And one potential explanation is that uh, maybe it's a capture of attention. When the thing starts to change, stimulus itself is constant. And the parset is changing, but the change itself captures attention. And in that case, you know, neural activity may be the correlate of the neural, um, uh, it's a, it may be the neural correlate of the attention, but not the consciousness. And this is something that we start to consider over the next weeks. And before going over to the attention, uh, I, I also want to make uh, uh, another point. So this is a uh, very important uh, uh, experiment uh, performed by Alex Meyer, my colleague. And he asked the question uh, whether that, if a given a neuron is in a neural correlate of consciousness, is it always the case as a part of the NCC or not? It's not uh, examined until he asked in a 2007 paper. So, the idea is that maybe there is some kind of genetic kind of disposition or connectivity of the neurons that makes one particular neuron to be responsible for one particular person or maybe other, but it's not changing. And so to test that, Alex did the experiment uh, using the different combination of the stimulus. So here, for example, you know, he tested uh, four different kinds of conditions. Okay, remember that MT uh, uh, neurons respond both in a preferred and anti-preferred stimulus. So he always uh, paired uh, preferred stimulus, uh, which is going to the left and also right, uh, uh, right moving side type of the grating. But also he tried four different direction to be you know, paired with this preferred or anti-preferred stimulus and then tested four conditions per neuron. Okay, and then what he found is that first, you know, in the case of the configuration one, he found that uh, when paired with the uh, uh, neural stimulus, then it's a bit complicated uh, figure, but uh, if he uh, flash this one first, uh, so let's see, if he flash left hemisphere, uh, uh, left going stimulus first, and then down going uh, stimulus second, then what he found is something like this of the neuron firing, right? And then the upper, uh, let's go first at the bottom figure. It's a control condition. So initially he presented uh, left moving stimulus and then that elicited lots of response for neuron and then moved to the uh, downward motion. So it made it very, very low in terms of firing. 
And then as a test of the condition, he used a, a, called, a, a technique called a flash suppression. So initially he was presenting left stimulus and then left stimulus is uh, uh, presented to the left eye all the time. However, he started to present uh, to the right eye downward motion only after starting from this period. And then it turned out that this kind of situation uh, generates a percept of left and then down reliably, almost like continuous flash suppression, right? And then if they do that, then because this neuron doesn't prefer uh, this bottom line, uh, you know, moving stimulus, you know, it uh, reduces firing similarly. And then when he swapped the orientation, uh, the order of these two stimulus, so instead of one and two, uh, now he uh, swapped the uh, order from one and two. And then in the case of control condition, it doesn't respond first and then respond a lot to this you know, downward stimulus. And then the, in the case of the uh, continuous, uh, the, the flash suppression, again, initially he, uh, the monkey perceives the left uh, the, the going downward. And then stimulus is now introduced after one second. So then it starts to respond like really strong. And then these uh, two conditions are similar, right? So that corresponds to the logic of the NCC. So this particular neuron is uh, likely to be the candidate of the motion qualia of a uh, left moving kind of experience. So now what he found with the other conditions. So this is a happy ending, right? Um, so he found that uh, even when he paired the stimulus with uh, you know, upper left, upper right moving stimulus to uh, left, uh, preferring stimulus, um, results are more or less the same, okay? So regardless of, of the uh, stimulus combination, you know, um, as long as stimulus is presented the way that, you know, neuron prefers or not, it doesn't matter. Alex was happy at this time. However, it didn't work that way uh, for all the neurons, in fact. So, in this case, you know, um, the preferred uh, direction is the left side, right? And then uh, he did basically the same thing. So first and then second, and then found that, you know, this is only, you know, responding to the preferred stimulus when the preferred stimulus is presented the first. And then when the uh, neural stimulus is presented the first, and then uh, they didn't respond and then uh, uh, responded in the second phase. Critically, when they were paired with uh, other stimulus, which is you know top right, uh, top right, you know moving stimulus, then now you know this part is the same, more or less the same, right? But here, previously, it started to respond when a uh, monkey saw this you know, preferred stimulus, but now even when they saw the preferred stimulus, it doesn't generate really strong response. So that's a problem. And he found, in fact, that as long as he changed the stimulus combination, then um, the, this proportion of the NCC actually changes. So when, when he uh, looked at only the one combination of the stimulus, then as the previous stimulus, uh, previous, you know, Nikos Rogothesis uh, experiment and so on, roughly 40% of the neurons were the NCC. Half of them are preferring anti-preferred stimulus and so on, but you know this is you know re replicating the previous stimulus, the previous results. However, when he tested with a full stimulus combination, the proportion of the NCC neuron start to increase up to ninety percent. So it implies that uh, as you try many different kind of combination of the stimulus under the binocular rivalry experiment. All, almost all the you know, previous estimate of the proportion of the NCC for B1, B2, which was 10 to 20%, might actually increase, increase up to 100%. But what does it mean, right? So that's a question. Also, there are many other questions that starts to emerge. Um, if you look at the um, NCC and the binocular rivalry literature. 
One is that uh, IT and the medial temporal lobe neurons. As I said, that uh, um, the, they are responding to the concept. It's uh, actually unclear whether they are corresponding to our phenomenology. When we see Jennifer Aniston, you know, we can distinguish different kinds of the Jennifer Aniston, and we don't see different Jennifer Aniston as a different, uh, you know, same thing, right? So it's a bit strange. And also IT and the uh, medial temporal lobe neurons have a really huge uh, receptive field. So anywhere in the uh, visual areas, the visual field, when they are presented, uh, that neuron might respond. But a visual qualia is usually quite a tie, uh, you know, um, tightly um, bound to the spatial location. So if I see, iPhone or you know um, some kind of earphone here and they here that's very different each time when I see the same thing it, at a different location it's a uh, it you know induces different experience so they themselves cannot explain our phenomenology at least it's incomplete secondary uh, the meaning of the anti-correlated firing during rivalry in both V4 and MT is also unclear. Well, why, you know, even if this particular neuron starts to fire um, pre, uh, before they start to, you know, perceive or um, increase uh, before they start to perceive, it's really unclear why this, you know, uh, particular neuron should uh, go into the opposite direction compared to when the stimulus is presented alone or a clearly visible situation or controlled situation or replay. So that, that starts to um, pose a possibility that um, it's actually uh, not really possible to think about or imagine um, NCC as a single neuron. And we do really need to start to think about the neural cores of consciousness as something that emerge from the potential uh, you know, population of the neurons. So in summary, in a human single unit recording, the NCC are found in the binocular rivalry experiment, but the replay condition and temporal dynamics raise the question of whether neurons reflect visual consciousness or something else, such as attention. And then in monkey uh, empty neuron recording, uh, depending on the stimulus combination, a neuron can become NCC or not. So what does this mean? Is the NCC of a simple concept as a, um, you know, NCC defined as a minimal subset of um, neuron, not really uh, possible to hold anymore. And that uh, leads to the rest of the uh, lectures uh, for the next you know, five weeks. So um, the question is, that, uh, is there any theory that can comprehensively explain all findings so far? And I will introduce uh, the theory called the IAT, Integrated Information Theory of Consciousness in uh, week 10 and 11. And they, they are highly promising on this regard. However, this theory is kind of complicated, complex. And so before going into this complex theory, let's consider alternative. And uh, uh, we will start with some, something more like psychological theory, and that would be simpler to understand simpler to explain possibly about consciousness. And one possible uh, strategy is to resort into psychological process such as attention. Can we explain consciousness by the concept of attention? And so to do that first uh, week eight and nine, we will consider a um, class of theories that try to explain consciousness within, using the concept of attention. And the uh, basic idea is that can we understand the consciousness once we understand this you know, concept of attention, how the neurons actually you know, achieve this attention. And then uh, after this, I will argue that you know, we do understand better about attention. And the more uh, we understand about attention, it starts to become very clear that attention and consciousness are probably very different. And uh, in week 10 and 11, that's the time that we need to go into the IAT, Integrated Information Consciousness. And then in week uh, 12, I'm going to explain the frontiers of consciousness research and that concludes this uh, series. All right, see you later, bye.
Stay tuned.